everybody. I am here with Jim, aka Kid Sure You Can. Did I say that right? Sure You Can. Yeah, like uh, the Street Fighter move. Although, if you want to scream it, that's that's okay. A lot of people like to <laughs> yeah. scream it. It would be more fun that way. Uh, so it is like nine thirty at night. Uh, I've been up since six, so I'm a little loopy. I got a sake here to celebrate because you are in Japan. <laughs> I got backup beers and. Who, who knows what we'll get to. Uh, it's morning your time, so I'm assuming you're not jumping right to beer. You're not doing Jimmy Hopps. No, I'm, ha- I'm having my uh, morning coffee out of the can here. Well, salute to your coffee can. <laughs> Come pie. Come in the pie. <laughs> so I, uh, I wanted to interview you because we have a bunch of mutual friends, and your name keeps coming up over and over, always positively, which is rare because <laughs> usually somebody's got some kind of story about somebody that did something douchey, and it's... Not, yeah. not from you. And um, every time I go to, to watch one of your videos, it's usually like at the end of the night and I go to queue one up and I'm like, I can't like, that's not fair. I'm half asleep. I'm not going to start one of your videos, fall asleep five minutes into it and then be like, hey, good, good video, Jim. Like, I'd rather just, oh, yeah. I'd rather just call this, you know, you know, introducing or, you know, getting to know, that's probably what I'm going to label this, getting to know Jim Kidshore you can because um, right. I, t- I saw you, your panel um, at Uplink and uh, I hear all the stories. So uh, why don't you start with where you live and how you got there? Uh, okay. And just before that, you know, oh. it, you probably haven't spoken to anybody that's <laughs> known me long enough to have a bad story about me. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> like, know me a little bit. Get get to know someone that I've known for like twenty some odd years, and you'll get plenty of stories of me being a total dick. But um, where I li- uh, I currently live in uh, Tokyo, Japan. Um, I've been here uh, going on ten years now. Um, when I first came here, it was in uh, July of 2010, and uh, at the time I was a medic in the uh, U.S. Air Force. So. Um, I was living and working at Yokota Air Base in West Tokyo, and you took the train from there about an hour, hour and a half or so to get to central Tokyo, so that was usually what I did with most of my time when I was off from work, was just go and hang out. Uh, My first weekend here, actually, um, you know, when you first get to a new base uh, overseas, they assign you a sponsor and everything. Uh, so my sponsor, luckily, was a guy that was into um, he was into building his own PCs and stuff. So he really liked going to Akihabara to get parts. So my first weekend here, he brought me to uh, Akiba so I could go get some games and stuff. Um, so I was uh, doing that for four years left because uh, I got reassigned to a base in Texas and uh, was not happy there. So I let my contract expire. I came back to Japan to attend college. Uh, went to two schools here in Tokyo, and then after I finished uh, school, uh, I started teaching. So I've been teaching English for about a year and a half now. And in addition to doing that, I, I do YouTube. I um, sell uh, a lot of games online, mm-hmm. and uh, that's that's how I make the bulk of my uh, money now. But yeah, uh, yeah, Tokyo, Japan, teaching, doing YouTube, and uh, all that kind of fun stuff. That. That about sums it up pretty well. That's pretty cool. I know a lot of people that have ended up um, in Japan in the military at some point, and they all they all loved it. They all had some really awesome stories about it. Yeah, when I was going to uh, school, um, both of the schools I went to, because they were American universities uh, that had campuses in um, Tokyo, one based out of uh, Wisconsin, the other one being Temple University based out of Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. And uh, both of those schools, because they're American schools, they accept uh, the GI Bill. So uh, both schools had uh, a lot of uh, military veterans there and even like a a veterans organization. And then uh, a lot of those people, you know, similar to me, um, had backgrounds in all kinds of things, medical and mechanic work. I was uh, uh, going to school and uh, eventually working uh, with a young lady who had been working in military intelligence as a uh, Chinese cryptolinguist hmm. and uh, went <laughs> went to university, was in the communications department with me because she wanted to work in television. Um, so, yeah, just lots of uh, veterans going there. And then when they get out, uh, most of them end up staying here in Japan and uh, doing one kind of work or the other. So That's pretty yeah. cool. I, I only spent 
a few moments in Japan, you know, between flights, but I spent quite a long time in Taipei, Taiwan, uh, and a bit in Shenzhen, China, and then a, a couple of, you know, I went to Beijing once and Hong Kong a couple of times, but all, you know, not more passing through than anything else. The only the only place out in Asia I really spent a good amount of time where I felt like I almost lived there was in Taipei, and I just, I never got a chance to really hang out in Japan, and I always regretted it. Well, you know, hopefully it's not going anywhere, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you get your chance. Yeah, it was a lot. It would have been a lot easier when I was already in Taiwan paid for by my company to be able to uh, to just pay out of pocket to go and, you know, bounce over to Japan for a few days and then you know, have that expensive flight back paid for by the company. So, uh, yeah, but hopefully uh, it's my understanding because I've been talking with some because I knew a lot of people that were planning trips here this year that I was intending to, you know, hang out with and stuff, and it all got canceled. Um, but, I mean, the rumor is that, well, not rumor per se, but because they're already on sale, but uh, flights, when they're actually on sale again, are going to be, like, dirt cheap. So probably once travel kicks back up again, there won't be a better time uh, to come and visit because uh, flights will be super cheap, and everyone's going to be happy to see you because they need those tourist dollars <laughs> that they're hurting right now. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, uh, I believe Beast went last year, and I missed the trip because yep. it came. He came on the same time that I was organizing a big event and everything. And I just there's no, I barely got that done, let alone throw a, a trip in there as well. Um, and I have a friend out in uh, Thailand as well, so I'm trying to think like when they start opening stuff up again, maybe that's my time to jump on it and just do a, a quick tour if I can out there yeah go for it yeah chris was here uh oh i forget when it was it was either january or february but uh he came here and uh met up and uh got to hang out with him beast for those who don't know and uh he was very very nice gentleman delivered a whole bunch of stuff for me uh a care package from uh mrs destiny fomo and uh and we hung out hunting for games and uh, ate steak and drank beers so it was pretty sweet yeah yeah Beast, good friend of mine. I got to know the whole New York uh, retro gaming crew around here. All, <laughs> all very good people. Yeah, I was actually just nice. hanging out with Destiny and her fiance before having the uh, having drinks before I came back and started on the sake. So it was, uh, it's, it's right fun on. to have people that live. I mean, I guess everybody in the New York scene lives within reason of each other. You know, within an hour on the train, but they're like a walk down the street, so it's a lot easier just to be like, "Hey, I got an hour That's to kill. Nice. Do you want to, you know, have a drink and <laughs> talk shit about video games and." <laughs> That's nice. So, um, I, I guess a lot of your videos talk about uh, like uh, going through into different places, finding different video games. I, I heard some of you, uh, you talk about it a bit in the panel, as well as uh, what you know what our friends have told about. But um, I guess, do you have a video of yours that you would recommend that people watch first to get started with your channel and like talk a little bit about your your findings and your your exploration? Yeah. Um... My most popular videos are always my game hunting videos. Um, so uh, if you were going to watch anything of mine first, I have uh, a lot of videos on uh, a chain of stores here called Hard Off, mm -hmm. which are um, recycle shops. So they get uh, a lot of used electronics and things like that turned in. And so most Hard Offs, if you go to them, they'll have a section dedicated to video games. And so that's where it's it's... The easiest to find lots of retro games and they're usually really cheap and uh, it's kind of a grab bag because it's just whatever's been turned in in like that general area so you could find you know nothing of interest but some places you go and you find like these, these crazy valuable things i've i've been at hard offs pretty much out in the middle of nowhere and found like you know magical chase on the pc engine and uh like wonder megas and all this kind of stuff you wouldn't expect to find in like a little town somewhere um, so yeah, anything on my channel having to do with hard off going to Saitama or various hard offs in Tokyo, um, I would watch those just to get a flavor for like the kinds of game hunts I do, the kinds of stuff I find and how I like to like edit and put together my videos. Cause I'm, I'm a fan of the, uh, the music montage, you know, I like, I like music and visuals and things. Um, and then the other stuff I, um, have shot a lot of videos in Akihabara, mm -hmm. which for those who don't know is an area of Tokyo uh, referred to as Electric Town. And uh, there's, I mean, there's lots of uh, stuff there dedicated to like electronics, but also like otaku culture. So like anime, manga, all that kind of stuff. It's a place where, you know, you'll find the most made cafes per capita and all that. Um, but there are a ton of retro game shops there. 
and I've filmed pretty detailed videos on all of them, you know, taking a look at like what they have available, comparing prices and stock and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, picking up games there and also uh, arcades as well. Mm -hmm. Quite a lot of arcades in Akiba. I've shot a lot there. Arcades around Tokyo in general. Um, yeah, if I was going to start with anything on my channel, probably the hard off videos because those are kind of fun because they involve a little bit of travel, a little bit of, you know, scenic uh, scenery and stuff. And, um, yeah, people people uh, tend to like those because you see a lot of, you know, pretty much anyone who's ever been here has shot a video in Akihabara. You know, but not a lot of them make their way to, you know, West Tokyo or Saitama or Chiba or Kanagawa or places like that. Um, so, yeah, those are those are really popular. And I would recommend watching those if you're going to watch probably, you know, one thing on my channel. Yeah. Does does anybody that works at these stores or owns them ever have problems with people going in with cameras and kind of recording their their journey through it? Yeah, most definitely. <laughs> really? Um, yeah. I mean, most shops don't don't care. Um, but there have been a couple of times, there's one shop in particular in, uh, Akiba called, uh, friends and they're a little mom and pop game store, uh, game store and they only uh, accept, uh, cash as well. Uh, so like, I don't know, they're very, I don't know. Someone said it was like a tax thing. I don't know. Um, but it's like, there's a, uh, you'll, when you go in, you'll get like one of two people probably at the counter on the first floor. There's two floors. Then it's, uh, if it's the old lady, She's really cool, and you can just like politely ask her if you can take any video or picture of the shop, and she'll always say yes, especially if you buy something. Mm -hmm. If you buy something, she's like, hell yeah, go for it. Um, but I think her son, though, uh, he he's not a fan of any of that, so if he sees any of that, or uh, he'll he'll yell at you. Hmm. And some people said that uh, he just if you um, if you walk in, if you're uh, just a foreigner in general, he might not take a, a much of a liking to you, and he might yell at you. Hmm. So. Friends in Akiba, prices are pretty good, and the old lady is very nice, but her son is a total asshole. And um, there have been uh, a couple of times, maybe at like a, a hard off or a, a book off, where people are like, oh, excuse me, could you stop that? And I'll be like, yeah, sure. Or an arcade. Sometimes arcades are not too um, – the arcade staff might ask you to stop uh, just because – they don't like people filming the players without the permission of the players. That makes sense. Um yeah, so if you want to, you know, shoot someone playing a game, it's it's polite to ask if you can shoot them first. Um, so it just and have being able to speak a bit of Japanese helps. So like I've gone into some arcades and before I've started shooting, I can explain to them that like I want to shoot the machines, I'll shoot myself playing, and if I shoot anyone uh, playing a game, I'll ask them for permission first. And then usually they're like, okay, that's fine. But if you just walk in and you're just you know mm. throwing your camera all around, they'll probably be like, hey, could you stop that, please? Um, but generally speaking, um, one of the last uh, hard off videos I did, uh, I could hear the staff talking behind me while I was um, shooting video, and they they were like, "Why is he doing that? I, I have no idea." Just and they were like, "Just leave him alone." <laughs> like they didn't they didn't understand why I was doing it, but they didn't really care. You know, mm -hmm. it was a, a hard off out in the Saitama somewhere. There was like nobody in the store, so they they really did not care what I was doing. Um, but just be mindful of that if you're gonna come here and you want to shoot some things. Um, in certain places, maybe just ask permission first. Um, so yeah, uh, but yeah, I've typically no one has a problem in the U S but I always, I always ask first and even like, mm. um, even before I did any videos in game stores, a buddy of mine, Justin, the Goodwill Hunter, he pretty much does what you do, but at Goodwill's in the U S yeah. um, like I would just go in and be like, Hey, you know, I, I'm waiting on a friend to see if he wants this. I just snapped a picture. Like I'm not trying to be weird with anything and no one's ever cared, but like, they definitely when I when they saw me like pick up a game and snap a picture of it, they were like, "What the heck's he doing?" And I was like, "Hey, look, I just gotta wait back. I don't know if my buddy needs this yet." No one ever cared. And the same thing with like walking around, just like, "Hey, you know, do you mind if I walk through and get a quick video for my th channel?" And most times they're they just you know, "What's your channel? You know, is this gonna air? We you know, we'll we'll retweet it for you or something." They're actually pretty awesome about it. So yeah, yeah. Um, I think I have at least one hard off. Oddly enough, it's the like a hard off like way up in like Hokkaido somewhere or something like that. But they they follow me on Instagram and stuff, so they know that like I go around to hard off and everything. And then also there's a um a place in Akiba called the Akihabara Container, where they have lots of uh, pop up shops for for you know various video game and anime properties and stuff. And uh, in there is also the um I think the tourist 
um, information center. So they they know I'm in there like all the time. Mm -hmm. So like when I first went in there, I told them, hey, I um, I asked him if I could, you know, shoot in there. And, uh, you know, told him I was going to put it on my YouTube channel and showed it to him and everything. So every time I'm in there now, uh, they know what I'm there for and stuff. And they're like, hey, how are the videos going? I'm like, oh, they're going pretty good. Thanks for asking. That's cool. Because uh, I'm in there like all the time. So, yeah, sometimes that works out. I always I always try to be as self-conscious as I am about how other people view me. That's one of the things like once you pass like 25, 26, you start to realize like you're not a, a kid anymore. Like if you like if you're, you know, even if you're right, if you're the one that people walk around the corner and you're the one yelling, that's all they see. They don't care or yeah. see what happened before it. So, I always try to like not yell back in those scenarios, but like it's hard sometimes. I just I had some like 85 year old lady yell at me yesterday like there's there's a line going to one of their f uh, shopping marts here and there's like a line around the corner and then like a bunch of people haphazardly standing in the middle so i'm like okay and there was a big gap so i was like guess that's where the line ends and i walked in front and just some lady just starts screaming at me what are you doing there's a line <laughs> and i look and half of the people were in line and the other half were just hanging out in the you know in the block and i'm just like you know you don't yeah. have to yell you could have just said something, you know, like, what's the problem? And she just kept yelling. And I'm like, if I continue this que this conversation, the only thing people are going to care about is there's a large fat man arguing with a tiny little angry old lady. And it's like, I lost this conversation before I even opened my mouth. And I just walked to the back of the line like, what an ass. Hope you don't fall look at this tyrant <laughs> ab abusing this defenseless old woman. Oh, I get that. So I. I get yelled at by old people here occasionally, usually on the train because they're mad because I was standing where they wanted to stand or sitting where they wanted to sit or something. Or some old man yelled at me because I didn't – when you get on a crowded train, you're supposed to take – your. if you have a backpack on, you take it and you turn around you put it on the front of you, right? That way you're not yeah. banging into people and stuff. And uh, I just forgot to do it one time and uh, an old man uh, just like yelled at me. He was like, you're so stupid. Turn your back around. I was like, oh, jeez. Sorry, Grandpa. That's kind of funny and kind of annoying at the same time. Yeah, yeah it's it's very irritating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just like yeah. All the time I spent in Taiwan, I, I almost every single experience I have was a hundred percent positive. Like, there was one time where I um I, the they lost my luggage on the airplane, so I I showed up basically in like a tank top, flip flops, and like beach shorts pretty much that was always my gear on the plane because i still would always you know i'm sure i'm going to offend somebody by saying this but i would always end up next to somebody in a full business suit on a 19 hour flight like hey i hope i hope you feel important over there but i'm the one that's going to be comfortable while you're the one uncomfortable yeah. feeling important <laughs> so here i am walking around and i went to the um i think it was called the global mall and i was just like I need clothes. They lost my clothes. And some people spoke perfect English and other people didn't and just thought it was the funniest thing in the world. Like they didn't mock me. They weren't assholes. I was just like fat man, lar large pants, <laughs> large shirt. And they're just laughing, like going in the back and the biggest sizes they could find. And it was just, everybody was really awesome. I always appreciated that. I didn't have any like walk in and get yelled at moments that I remember. I think there was one in like China, but I yelled back and they, they stopped. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I have, like, I could do that. Like, if I just started barking at people, they would probably just leave me the hell alone. But I just, it's uh, it's not in my character to do that. And, uh, but yeah, I would say being here for, like, 10 years, uh, like, 95% positive, you know, every, you know, it's been, been really great. And, um, yeah, and then I have a friend in the same situation, although my friend is much larger than you. <laughs> so we had, he has to be very selective about his clothes. But it's actually worked in his benefit. He's been in a... At least one commercial for like plus sized uh, clothing stores here, uh, which was was nice for him. He got to play a big fat alien who comes to Earth and can't find clothes in his size. That's amazing. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I would never so mind yeah, it's being been, the butt of that joke. If I ever showed up at a place yeah. and they're like, "Would you like to be a plus size model today?" I would be so happy. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, totally. I'll model whatever you want. Um, yeah, so. Uh, like a decade here, like ninety five percent positive. I mean, you're gonna run into a you know an asshole occasionally, no matter where you are. Um, but for the most part, everybody, you know, anyone I've I've come into contact with has been really cool. So, yeah, I, I'm not couldn't could complain at all, really.
Yeah, generally speaking, all the cities I've been to around the world, everybody was real cool because they were used to foreigners. Whether it was foreigners in a big country where you're just not from that part of the country, like that happens all the time, obviously, in the U.S., or it's, you know, just a small country where they're so used to everybody popping in and out. Like, it was pretty cool. So. Yeah, the only time it's a little different here, um, I mean, in Tokyo, it's, it's one thing. It's, it's the I would say, like the most international city in Japan. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you get out to the country a little more, um, I mean, typically they're used to seeing foreigners there in the capacity of maybe like uh, some like English teachers or something like, you know, they'll see a few people here and there. Um, so it's it's a little it's a little different there um, when you're in like central Tokyo. Everything's fine. But if you go out a little further, like when I was living in Kanagawa, you might get a, a few um, a few sort of like sideways looks or uh you know, some some kids staring or something like that. But, you know, it's not really that big of a deal. Yeah, out of all the places I've traveled, which still, by the way, it still blows my mind that I say that. I was like the little poor kid that never went anywhere on vacation. And I got this one job in week two. They were like, go get your passport. You're going to be going some places. But <laughs> I don't want to say the name because it's been over 10 years since I was there. But it was actually a place in the U.S. that I never felt more out of place anywhere in my entire life. And I never fit in <laughs> anywhere. So for me to say that meant means a lot. But like it was just strange it felt like i was on another planet and then you know i land in taipei taiwan and it's like this is like new york but a little different like i love this this is feels like home so <laughs> it's it's how it feels for me uh going home these days it's it's kind of i'm originally from uh, southern louisiana mm-hmm. and so and I, I don't really get home that much but when i do go home it's like you realize how used to things you've gotten like in like a, a certain way so like here i'm used to like the the bathrooms here i guess you could say and like uh the food and the convenience of like public travel and uh, all these things that are you know these great parts of like you know life in in tokyo and in japan in general that you kind of take for granted when you're here mm. but then when you go home and you have like none of those things and it's just like uh how do you live like this so <laughs> like i feel a little i, I feel kind of out of place when i go home i uh i think when i was coming back for school uh one of my brothers was concerned that I was moving to a communist country, so I had to, I had, I had to explain to him uh, the difference between Japan and China. So I can't tell fun. you how many people I know keep saying, "How was Thailand? How was Thailand?" And I'm like, "No, I was in Taiwan this whole time, <laughs> Taiwan." And I'm like, yeah. in my head, like I don't want to be racist, but I'm like, "God damn, we really are dumb Americans." And then, yeah. and then sometimes I'd pop over to China, and they'd be like, "How was Thailand?" And I'm like, "No, <laughs> no." <laughs> Damn. Taiwan, am I saying it wrong? Is this me? Is it not you? Is it me? But <laughs> so like, we're it's all just, idiots now a, and then. <laughs> it's it's a global thing, I guess, because like I run into that. Like I um uh, I teach uh, English here, and um and just in general, run into a lot of people socially, and um uh you there the ideas that like uh, John and Jane Q Japan have about America are kind of very broad, you know, like. Uh, hamburgers and, and like uh, like hamburgers and like rock music and uh, Trump and uh, uh, you know, it's just very very like broad strokes and usually when I tell people like if they ask me where I'm from specifically I'm like I'm from Louisiana and they're like oh cool where where is that what is that and I'm like oh I have to you have to like explain like where it is and and I'm like have you ever heard of New Orleans and they're like oh yeah yeah New Orleans I've heard of that like they usually uh, they've heard of New Orleans but they don't know what Louisiana is so hmm. yeah. Kind of thing around the world. It is funny to hear some of the American stereotypes. And uh, a friend of mine, um, born and raised in right outside of London, he came to work here for a while. And then when I went to London for work, he kept like egging me on. He's like, "You are just, you are the loudmouth, obnoxious American. You know, you're going to embarrass <laughs> yourself. Just, just being an ass." But I am kind of a loudmouth, obnoxious person. Yeah. So every time he'd try to rile me up, just just to be silly, like I'd get going and then I would just shut down. I know what you're doing. I'm not going to be that guy. I'm going to have manners this time. <laughs> Catch that shit here because um, especially I'm kind of a night owl, so I like to go out and hang and drink, visit the bars and stuff. And when there was still a lot of tourism, you know, any weekend I would go out, I would meet people from, you know, all over the world. And for the most part, it was pretty cool. But every once in a while, actually... I mean, I've run into some dicks in the past. I think the dickiest person I ever ran into, though, not to, not to uh, belittle the people of your city, but they were from New York, and they were a total ass because I was at one end of the bar, they were at the other, and I was talking with some people. I think they were from Ireland, and um, 
uh, we, uh, they had asked me where I was from. So I was telling them, you know, I'm from uh, Louisiana and I was telling them a bit about where I was from. And then the person down at the end of the bar, uh, was like, Oh yeah, you know, there's, there's New York and there's like, there's New York, there's California. And then there's like the rest of America, you know? And I was, you know, so I was like, dude, I'm not going to say what I said, but you know, <laughs> um, but, uh, I don't know if it was, uh, some, some folks from Australia, I was hanging out in a bar with a friend of mine and it was a pretty mixed crowd. There were Americans and, uh, French and British and, um, you know, lots of people, Filipinos, Japanese, everybody. And, uh, it's just me and two other American dudes were sitting on one end of the bar closest to the door. And so like this woman and a guy walk in and, uh, we had all been drinking for a while. We we're having a good time. So when they walked in, we were like, Hey, you know, you know, give them a nice welcome. And then she stops and she goes, is everybody in here American? <laughs> and <laughs> I was like, you wish. <laughs> yeah. Nah, so, you know, whatevs. Yeah. I don't know. I, I got into trouble one time in Taiwan because there was this guy from a European country that was sitting next to me. And I we were just talking. He was like, have you ever been to where I'm from? I'm like, no, but I think I have a trip scheduled there. I'm really looking forward to it. You know, I always heard about this place, that place. Have you ever been to America? And he looks at me like I just ate a piece of shit. He's like, <laughs> I would never go to America with your president that you have. I'm not even going to say which president. It wasn't even our current one. But the point is, it's like, <laughs> I just looked at him. I was like, don't. Don't you think it's actually even more ignorant to say that all Americans are assholes because of their president than it is to, isn't it more ignorant to say that than you're accusing us of being? And like, everybody yeah. was just <gasps> and like, you know, next thing you know, like the boss came over like, hey, Bob, we need you over here. And like, we were separated for the whole <laughs> the whole time. I guess I, I caused trouble with one of their uh, other customers, but whatever. I'm not, yeah. not going to sit there and just take it for no reason. That was polite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's all good. Usually I just let stuff like roll off the i'm like yeah whatever i don't give a fuck you know who are you uh yeah. but every once in a while if i've had an if i've had enough drinks i'll be like a tiny little bit argumentative but that's you know yeah it's extenuating circumstances i've grown into that i used to be the person that always <laughs> needed to stand up for themselves and then like i calmed down and i feel like it's like a slippery slope where like at some point soon i'm just gonna be that guy you know get off my lawn just you know <laughs> old and angry like clint eastwood from gran torino <laughs> i'm looking forward to it i'm gonna i'm gonna get a lawn just so i can yell at people to get off it yeah. i don't even really want a lawn <laughs> I don't miss mowing lawns, not at all. I don't miss shoveling snow or mowing lawns. So. No, I don't. Um, yeah, growing up, uh, Louisiana, uh, especially summertime, real hot, real humid, not the best time to do anything outside. And uh, that was, we always had to be outside, mostly because our parents just didn't want us in the house. <laughs> it's like 100 degrees outside. And they're like, no, go play outside. Go away. Stop coming in and out. You're letting all the cool air out. Just stay outside. We're like, I can't. I'm dying. There's a hose outside. Drink from the hose. <laughs> Stop squirting your brother really, in the just, face. <laughs> really, they just didn't want us around. I have uh, five siblings. Uh, and uh, <laughs> really, my parents were just like, please, for the love of God, get out of my house. Uh, so I understand now. At the time, though, I thought I was going to die of heat, uh, heat stroke. So <laughs> you do. I was one of those idiots that always just would love to be outside. Like it could be drizzling and I'd rather jump on my bike and ride around than be inside. That's why I like the, yeah. I, it's still kind of surprising that I got so hard into video games. And then like, as soon as I got a license in a car, it was like, you'll still be here <laughs> when this wears off. So that's so why I stopped playing games for a while and then go back into it later on. I got a lot more into being like outside as an adult, really. Like as a kid, we would, you know, um, even when we didn't have to, we would do outdoorsy things. I would, uh, we were, uh, we would go fishing a lot. Uh, so I'll go fishing with my dad and stuff like that and go play outside with the other kids and everything. But for the most part, I really wanted to just go home and play video games or something. Um, now though, um, I appreciate like a lot more going out and, uh, not, not right now, like summers in, uh, Tokyo are just like brutal. Mm. So like, this is the time of year where content on my channel always slows down because I do not feel like going outside in this bullshit. <laughs> and uh, the, other, the other week, we were on a, a short break from work, so me and my girlfriend, she wanted to go to this zoo in uh, Saitama because they had a white tiger and everything. So I was like, I really don't want to do that. Let's go to the aquarium <laughs> or something. <laughs> but she kept pushing it, so I was like, all right, let's go to the freaking zoo. So we go to the zoo, and it's like a hot as – it's like the surface of the sun. It's just unbearably hot, and all of the animals are just asleep. 
like the white tiger is there and he's just sleeping off in a shady spot somewhere and doesn't give a shit. It was like so lame. And I was just seeing all these dads just walking around with their families. And I was like, all right, I get it now. <laughs> this is what we put my dad through. I, he didn't want to do any of those things we, we made him do when we were kids. <laughs> um, so I'm like just walking around like burning heat. And she's like, um, and I'm like, I'm ready to go at this point. And she's like, oh, do you want some shaved ice? And I was like, hell no, I don't want shaved ice. I want to get the hell out of here. <laughs> I was like, you get shaved ice. I'll be in the gift shop. You know, so it was That's just funny. like one of those days. So I, I, at the end of that day, I was like, you know what? This was a horrible day. We're going to TGI Fridays. Uh, and we're going to we're going to drink daiquiris. Do, and we did. Do they have a bunch fantastic. of those chain, chain stores out there? Like chain yeah, restaurants? Yeah, yeah. You'd be surprised. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you'd, you'd probably be surprised at how much um, American like chain restaurants you can find here. Obviously, there's going to be like a ton of McDonald's. Like they're just everywhere. McDonald's very popular here, uh, as well as KFC. Hmm. KFC is super popular in Japan. Uh, Burger King, Wendy's, yeah, stuff like TGI Fridays. Um, there's like one Carl's Jr., like in the whole country, and it's in Akihabara. So I like to stop by Carl's Jr. whenever I can. Uh, yeah, stuff like that. And then um, there are some restaurants here that, that that's what they're sold on. Like there's a place uh, nearby me called Fats. It's a uh, uh, dude that runs it is from California. He's a big fat dude, uh, but he makes these like really awesome burgers and stuff like that. So there are like a lot of restaurants around here that are foreign owned, and that's sort of the selling point. Like when I was at the base. Uh, every uh, summer we would have this friendship festival and we would open up the gate and everybody would come on and we would turn the flight line into like a festival area with like uh, booths and food and we'd have like bands playing all day and you could go and like uh, people could go and uh, explore the the planes and talk to pilots and take pictures with everybody and everything. Now those were always a great weekend because one you were uh, I was a medic so I was always out there doing like you know because it was always August when they decided to do this so people passing out left and right. Um, um, but it was like a great way to like meet chicks cause you're walking around, you're in your uniform. I got my little medical badge on and be like, that's right, ladies, I save lives. <laughs> Who wants to take a picture with me? Um, but yeah, they would, and, uh, just the food would get consumed like crazy cause we would have stands set up where, you know, like the, the medical group would be one here and the mechanics and all that, they would be over here and they would be serving hot dogs and burgers and all that kind of stuff. So we would like, so many people would come like just for the food. Um, so there are a lot of places uh, that sell themselves on that, like, you know, this place is like an American burger place or steak place, or this is like a, uh, there's a Tex-Mex restaurant uh, near here. Actually, uh, right close to where I live is an area of Tokyo called Kichi Joji. And um, uh, is it, no, Koenji, that's it, Koenji. And Koenji is really well known for having lots of stuff like that, like foreign uh, restaurants and bars and things like that. And I guess like back in like the nineties or something like that was like the place to hang out in Tokyo. Um, so yeah, there's like a lot of stuff like that, lots of foreign foods and foreign food chains and things like that. So even though like I, I try my best to eat at least like a little bit healthy cause it's kind of easy to do that here. I'm still like, if I'm in Shinjuku, I'm like, you know what would be good right now? A Baconator. <laughs> Let's, go to, you know. <laughs> Let's go to Wendy's. I, I always uh, loved I'm, eating yeah. the, the food local to wherever I was going. But I did. I used to have a routine where like this bar in uh, in Stanford, Connecticut, I or either there was two different bars where I would like get in my car and I would be driving to the airport, usually at night because it was usually a night flight I would take. And I would go and I'd have like a Guinness or a Smittix and either just a big ass burger or a quesadilla. And then I'd go because like there's not a lot of cheese based foods out in Taiwan, not 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 uh-huh. like a quesadilla, and they have good burgers, yeah. but not like not, you know just uh, like we don't do sushi the way you guys do in Japan. They don't do burgers the way we do here, type of thing. And uh, you know that would be pretty much it. But I'd always stick to the local food, and I like I'd have people always ask the same question very politely. But one guy at one company just came out and said it in front of everybody one day. He's like. How come you always eat local food? Like, you know, you, don't you want American food? I'm like, no, I, I love all kinds of food. I always have. And he goes, but I don't get it. Like, you just went to three different countries and you <laughs> ate three different local foods. I'm like, yeah. He goes, 
how do you not have diarrhea? <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> people had hinted around that before, but he was the only one to ever just come right out and say it. A guy from Uzbekistan just like came right out and yelled it. And everybody's kind of looking at me. I was like, well, what's the worst thing I could happen? I'm in a place where I don't speak the language too well or at all. I ask for a bathroom. And if I'm in there too long, or I know I'm going to be in there too long, I just say something like, I got to go call my mother. And then I walk out and I come back 20 minutes later and everybody's like, what did he mean by that? But no one asks, so, so screw it, whatever. Yeah. And he's just like, oh, yeah, all right, that makes sense. <laughs> after, I mean, dude, after enough years of, I mean, I've been here long enough. I've eaten more than my fair share of sushi and and uh, okonomiyaki and, and, and tempura. Oh, you know, I've, I've tried everything here. I've literally eaten, like, uh, raw horse, uh, like horse sashimi and stuff like that. So there's nothing that I've been like, oh, no, I'm not going to try. Like, I've tried everything. I've eaten, uh, you know, yeah, a lot of Japanese food. It's just that when you're in Tokyo, there's like endless options. You know, I can, you know, walk down, you know, walk downtown and and go eat Italian. I can go eat German food. There's a really great German restaurant where I used to go to school in uh, Shinjuku, or I can go eat like a, you know, just a big greasy burger, or I can go eat some sushi, or you know, really whatever I want. So sometimes, uh, yeah, just I need meat and cheese. I, I to, you know, know satiate. If you've been there for if you've been there for an extended time, you just those things that your your comfort food, whatever it is to you, you do want at some point. But that's right. actually, as far as that goes, comfort food. Uh, I don't even. I'm just gonna do uh, plug a, a restaurant. But there's a, a restaurant in an area of Tokyo called Azabu Juban, mm-hmm. and it's called the 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 Soul Food House. It's owned by some uh, nice people from Atlanta. Um, and, uh, like I said, I grew up in Louisiana. I grew up on like Southern cooking and uh, Cajun food in particular. And so at the soul food house, the only place in Japan so far that I've actually been able to get a decent bowl of gumbo. Uh, so that place is awesome. Also their chicken fried steak, the chicken and waffles and all that kind of stuff. It's freaking amazing. That's pretty uh, neat. so yeah, just if you're ever in Tokyo, I know it's a great place to take a date too. Cause you know. Nice and atmospheric, great music. Thursdays are open mic night. Uh, Soul Food House, Tokyo, check it out. <laughs> open mic. And, and they had, uh, I'm sure you have them there. I don't know if it's called the same, but my friends brought me to a KTV one night in uh, in Taiwan. And I, I don't like singing. I'm not good at it. I do. I sing back up in the band and I, I've sang before and I can do it, but like you don't really want me to. Like, I could sing in key. I just, <laughs> you know, if I try my absolute hardest, I could make it sound not meh. But that's that's all I'll give me on that one. And they're like, oh, you got to do it. I'm like, I don't like doing karaoke. It just makes me uncomfortable. Give me a guitar. I'll play a song for you. But like, like no, you got to do it. And there was the whole culture of like, you're in the room, you get the microphones and you're on. And I loved the concept of it. I just, man, I finally drank. I was being such an asshole that night. I was like, I want to, I'm going to order the biggest beer on the menu. Figuring like, I was looking for one of those like really tall margaritas or something like the yardstick ones. And my friends are like, um, well, I don't think they have that here. I'm like, yeah, yeah, there's a big beer right there. And we all had a couple of drinks in this. And they were like, no, that's that's really big. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I want. <laughs> really big. A really big beer. And everybody just starts laughing. And they brought it over. And it was a Heineken keg can. So it was like, you know, 20 <laughs> beers in a can. And I'm like, oh. and of course they were like, well, now you got to finish it. And like 10 of those <laughs> later, I'm singing, um, I'm singing that song from Top Gun when they were at the bar, <laughs> the Righteous Brothers song. <laughs> Somebody's nice. got that on video somewhere. It was horrifying. <laughs> I, I, I personally, I, I actually really like uh, karaoke. Um, I like that, you uh, you know, I mean, there are karaoke bars where you can go to and, you know, everybody just sings and the people in the bar ha- are subjected to it. Um, but like all of the big, like karaoke con and, uh, joy sound and all that stuff where you get your own little private room and you know, that's great. Cause it's just like you and your friends dicking around, you know, yeah. like nobody really cares who, who can sing or who can't. Um, so that, that's the perfect time to do it and everybody's drinking. So like it's, it's way more fun. And, uh, but you know, you do make some, like, uh, I was in there with an, uh, an ex-girlfriend once and her mom and her uncle decided to go out, uh, with us. And so we're at a karaoke bar and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm pretty good at singing like oldies, you know, like, uh, Bobby Darren and, uh, maybe like Everly brothers or, um, uh, who, oh, oh, oh oddly enough, uh, Lou, Lou Rawls, like you'll never, you know, you know uh, you're going to miss my love stuff like oh, that. Right, like right, I'm, yeah. I'm pretty good. 
I'm pretty good at stuff like that. That requires like maybe like a little more bass. And, uh, so that's what they were expecting was just like nice, you know, all, you know, stuff like that. And I had a few drinks in me. And so I was just like, I got this, you know, karaoke thing here. I'm going to wonder if they've got cannibal corpse on oh, this thing. <laughs> tell me you did. Hammer and Smash they did. <laughs> yes. That was, they had one cannibal corpse song and it was, it was hammer smash face. Yep. So, uh, I just, I don't know why I did that, <laughs> but her mom and her uncle were not impressed. <laughs> but you were in a room with your friends, right? Yeah, it was me, my girlfriend, her mom, and her uncle. Right, so that's totally different. I can't stand it. Like, I love metal. I don't look it, but I am I am the biggest metal head on the planet. Like, if I had long hair and tattoos, it would make more sense. But every once yeah. in a while, somebody will drag me to a bar and be like, hey, well, karaoke starts at 9 o'clock. And so I'll show up at 7 and plan on leaving at like 9.05. And sure as shit, we're in a room full of people and somebody wants to sing Du Hast, which is an amazing song <laughs> that I love so much. But you're in a, a room full of a bunch of people that do not want to hear that song. <laughs> like, it just it drives yeah. me nuts. Like, man, wrong place, wrong time. But private yeah. m- amongst your friends? Oh, absolutely. Hammer smash face it up. <laughs> Yeah, it's great. You know, I can do I do uh, that or like uh, I do a pretty good uh, Dave Mustaine, oh, actually. I was just going to say, so, do Tornado of Souls. <laughs> no, I'm sick. I don't do Tornado. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I like to do um, uh, Sweating Bullets. Uh, that's a good one. Hello, me. Meet the real me. Absolutely. In my misfits way of life. So people, you know, that's that's always like a, a crowd pleaser. So like I like to do stuff like that. Or like Rammstein, like I'll do like Sunna or, yeah, or something yeah. like that. Yeah, those that's always popular. And oddly enough, I do a pretty good uh, B-52s, uh, Fred Snyder from B-52s. So I'll do like Rock Lobster or, or something like that. Um, but yeah, karaoke is always fun because it's just you and a handful of friends in a private room. And you can get a bunch of drinks in you and get stupid. And, uh, you know, that's always fun. You know? mm. All right. So we were, uh, I just took a quick moment to grab another beer and we were just mentioning equipment that you were using. Um, what do you use to shoot your videos with? Do you just do it run and gun style with your cell phone or do you have other stuff? No, I, I very rarely use my phone to shoot anything. I have a, uh, Canon G five X, nice. um, which is, I wonder if it's, it's actually over here. So this little guy, Canon G five X. Which is um, very um, convenient. I don't really have a any uh, particular like uh, stick or anything. I hold it on, so I usually like grip it like this, and it's very stable and very uh, good for the kind of stuff I do. Because it's also kind of inconspicuous. Um, I have a Sony HD Handycam, which is around here somewhere. Uh, I use that a little bit. I used to use a, um, a Lumix. Like uh, what was it like a G four or something like that? Um, that was that was pretty nice, um, and uh, yeah, that's about it. And then my phone whenever I need to, um, but yeah, not nothing too uh, spectacular, you know, no uh, really high end uh, recording equipment or anything like that from me, which I think most people will uh, already know if they've watched any of my videos that you know they're not the most. Um, uh, heavy on like production qualities and like super like 4K and all that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah, I mean and they're more vloggy. Nobody needs that. the The only reason I I really took the time to upgrade my equipment is because I do. You know, if I'm if I'm using the equipment for other stuff, I might as well use it for the me shots and everything else too. But I really wanted something that could take the best shots of CRTs, which I still haven't perfected that at all. I wouldn't even say I'm good at it. I'm just passable. Um, And I just wanted stuff to match the other footage. So if I'm capturing video and I'm taking the time to scale it to 4K60, like, then what am I going to do? Pan to me talking to a 1080p webcam that barely works? Like, no, like, that doesn't make sense. I might as well. So, yeah. But I don't think... I got a little... I got the opportunity to work with, like, really high-end equipment when I was at a uh, production studio in Rapungi. And uh, I was working on, uh, I mean, a lot of stuff for them. We were shooting uh, a lot of footage for AP in the UK, the Allied Press. Mm-hmm. So we were shooting all these like uh, video packages for them. Um, and then with uh, while we would be on these locations shooting all this stuff, we would like shoot extra stuff for ourselves and things like that. And we were um, putting that into a uh, YouTube channel that we um, had for the company called Japan Headlines. Because um, that was kind of like my 
primary function there because um, I was still in school and the uh, the uh, owner of the company, he was like, hey, we don't have much of a social media thing going on, especially YouTube, so why don't you uh, try to uh, get those numbers up? So I was like, cool, whatever. Um, so while I was there, I did get to mess with like really like big like like television quality like cameras and stuff. Just all these like huge cameras, giant tripods, microphones, all this kind of cool stuff. So I got really well acquainted with all this stuff. It's actually a really valuable thing to be there. Um, just working with like a lot, you know, editing software and stuff and um, getting a lot of, because uh, I was uh, interning. So they were teaching me a lot, like the camera operators and the editors and stuff. Um, so I'm acquainted with like much better equipment. I could, you know, use it competently and all that. I just don't have it because that stuff is really expensive. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I just... I'm a hardware nerd as it is, so you know, getting into your equipment is something that's I'm gonna I'm gonna enjoy no matter what I'm doing. Even if I was just making videos for myself and my friends and not trying to trying to do anything with it, I still like I still like it, but it's just it's it's so easy to drop an insane amount of money to get like one percent better a video, you know. Yeah. That's why like when I started on YouTube, it was um and a lot of those, they're, they're still up. I, like, I never deleted those first videos, but they're awful. They're really, really bad. Like a shitty little camera, and I didn't know how to edit. I didn't even know I had editing software. So the video starts with like my hand coming away from the camera and ends with me turning the camera off. And it looks bad, and it sounds like shit. And uh, eventually, like I was like, uh, what? Did, I discovered that I had Windows Movie Maker on my laptop. So I was like, oh, you mean I can like edit a video and stuff? Cool. And that was sort of like... The genesis of that. So there was, and then those are almost worse because the editing is so stupid and just like terrible. So I was like, it should have been maybe unedited, but um, but that was sort of like the genesis of that, just like dicking around with my computer and my camera and stuff because I was shooting like pickups videos and um, and then just watching like other people that I was becoming acquainted with on YouTube shoot their little um, especially like some of the um, uh, people I was acquainted with in the UK. They would um, shoot videos of themselves going to like car boots and stuff like that. Um, they're, you know, game hunting trips and uh, all that stuff. So those were some of the first people I was watching uh, when I started uh, this channel was uh, a lot of people in the UK doing pickups videos and going to car boots and stuff. So I was like, OK, I do something like that. I was like, I go to hard off probably like every weekend so I can take the camera with me for something like that. So that was kind of how that started. But yeah, it was just back in the day, terrible, terrible cameras and like Windows Movie Maker. And that was <laughs> that was the beginning. Awesome. I think. And now it's it's slightly better now. Slightly better. <laughs> I think my first handful of videos were all edited in Windows Movie Maker. And I think the only reason I, I took the plunge into something else was because I, I just wanted to have basic stuff floating alongside of me, like the most basic, basic editing that, you know, one hair over what Windows Movie Maker could do. And that's that I just took the plunge and was like, all right, I guess I'm doing Premiere then. Because I learned, like, I tried to learn all of the free ones, and I'd spend hours mm -hmm. with each. And then it would get almost done, and then I'd, like, try to import a file from a different camera, and it wouldn't import. You'd have to re-encode everything. And it's like, or, like, one yeah. feature wouldn't work right or something. So I was just like, you know, I just, why don't I just learn what everybody else is using and, and bite the bullet then? Yeah. Yeah, I've used so many different kinds. I've used, you know, uh, Movie Maker in the beginning and then started using something that was similar, very, like, simple um, editing software called Shotcut. Mm -hmm. And and uh, that was that worked for what I needed at the time, which was basically nothing. Um, and then learning how to use Premiere. And uh, more recently, I've been using a software called HitFilm, mm, yeah. um, which has been... Uh, uh, really useful because you can you can get the the you know hit film express for free mm -hmm. and if you want to you can pay like a one time like few hundred bucks and just get like everything like the hit film pro but then you but if you want just like specific things like oh no i just want like a this little lighting package or maybe like this little effects pack or something like that you can buy those things like individually for like 10 bucks so you can just like get the things that you really want and then all the stuff that's kind of superfluous you can just like mm -hmm. you know leave all that to the side and it's so far that's been working for me really well because it's it's a very easy all-in-one like you know editor and then your effects and uh audio stuff and all that kind of like condensed into like a single uh piece of software so i've been enjoying that actually it's one of the ones i tried but this is 
over five years ago. So I'm sure it's way better. Mm. And another one I tried was DaVinci Resolve, which at the time, it just didn't seem very intuitive. And everybody I talked to now is like, you got to try it again. And I downloaded it. I installed it. I started to edit a video like, all right, let me get all my stuff ready. And I went... I don't have two hours to learn this stupid thing. Like, like I need to t- spend the rest <laughs> of my day editing this damn video, not learning a new piece of software. So it's just sitting on my computer. Yeah, there is um, there is yeah, one even- plugin though that all retro nerds should probably know about. Uh, shout out to my life in gaming for sharing this one. But if you use Premiere, there's a plugin called the GPU Resize that allows you to control how each thing is scaled. So you could take a 240p image and you could scale it to 4K with integer, bilinear, however you want to use it. Um, and I, I don't know if plugins like that exist for these other softwares. So that's kind of another reason why, because I used to pre-render everything. So you've, I've just added six hours worth of work to a video that, you know, in Premiere with this plugin, it's six seconds worth of drop the plugin in, set the resolution, move on. So Nice. Okay, that, that sounds super convenient. Um, but yeah, I will say like, even from when I started using it, maybe two years ago, uh, hit film has improved quite a bit because they do release, you know, updated versions every year. And, uh, they're also especially, um, good about, uh, I guess the people that, uh, own and operate hit film, they, um, uh, provide a lot of, uh, tutorials, for not just like the basic usage of the software, but also like more fun stuff, like how to produce like certain effects and things like that inside the program. Um, so that's always nice that they pr- they provide a lot of updates on that kind of stuff. Hmm. Um, but yeah, Premiere as well. I've used Premiere a lot in the past. That was like the only the only thing we could use. Like when I was in uh, college, and um, when I was working at the production studio, uh, yeah, everything was one hundred percent Adobe stuff. Hmm. Now you're making me want to, to spend some more time with it. I wish I could just spend it. I wish I had a free day that I could just go through, yeah. these, you know, the journey I went through five or six years ago and redo it and see if I, I like any of these other newer ones. But I'd be, I'd be willing to bet you you would like a hit film more now than because, yeah, I would say just having used it a couple of years ago and seeing it's better now. Like I can imagine like five years ago, it was pretty bare bones, you know. It actually, that was the one that I'm, if I remember correctly, that I enjoyed the interface. I thought it was really intuitive, but none of the files I had would work. I would have to re-encode every single file before using it. Yeah. Yeah. They, that's one of the, you know, um, if, unless you have like the pro package or something, which uh, allows you to, you know, use basically any kind of file type. And it'll, it'll do that, like, oh, your current version does not support this file type. Like, shit. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. So that's the drawback of uh, being a, a cheapskate like me. <laughs> so, uh, would you consider yourself, I'm just, I'm looking at all your games behind you. Would you consider yourself more of a collector or more of a gamer, you think? Um, these days, more of a gamer because all of the games I have behind me here, I've had these for like a decade or, or more. When, when I first came to Japan, I started just buying up like everything. Because they were like, I had a lot of, I was young, had a lot of expendable income, and there were like hard offs like all around me, and I could just go to Akiba on the weekends when I wanted to. So I was, when I first got here, initially all I was doing was um, buying Japanese versions of a lot of like my old favorites. So I was buying like Super Famicom versions of like Zelda and you know like Rockman X and stuff like that, and then I got more into the uh, expanded Japanese library for various consoles finding all these sort of um you know uh not always weird just some games that are baffling why they weren't released in the u.s because like they're good uh they're you know maybe some kind of uh, licensed property or um something to that effect but uh, just weren't released in the u.s for whatever reason so it's always like i became more interested in like finding those and picking up those so that's when i went crazy on the buying you know where i realized i can go to hard off I can go buy like a PlayStation for like, you know, 30 bucks and then go to the, you know, the junk bins, which most of the stuff in it isn't really junk. It works. It's just not in like great condition. Mm -hmm. And I can just go and start buying all these games for like 100 yen. So I would go one weekend, buy a PlayStation and then come home with like a stack of like 30 games and be like, all right, let's let's play some games like I have tech in here. But then I also have some weird stuff I've never heard of. So just spend the weekend drinking beers and trying out all these games and stuff. So most of this I've had for a long time. Um, I sold a big chunk of my collection when I was in Texas mm-hmm. before I came back to Japan. 
And even today, like I'm still like uh, stuff is coming off the shelves pretty regularly. Actually, I just sent Destiny a huge box of PlayStation 2 and Xbox 360 games and all that stuff just because I was like, all right, time to get rid of some of this because um, I'm becoming less of a collector these days and more focused on just having things that I enjoy playing. A big, um, a big uh, catalyst for that uh, recently was uh, Destiny actually gave me a Nintendo Switch because mm. she knew I had no current generation <laughs> stuff. Because <laughs> I just like I was like I don't give a shit, whatever. Um, so you know they sent me over a Switch and some games, and since then I've been really into that. Been playing stuff that's been coming out on it, you know, uh, Dragon Quest and. Uh, Persona 5 Scramble recently and just playing, you know, the usual stuff, the Zeldas, the Marios, all that kind of thing. I was going to say, thing. I loved so um, uh, Link's Awakening on that. I thought that was a really well done port. I, I still need to play Link's Awakening. I, I finished Breath of the Wild mm-hmm. and like Mario Odyssey, Dragon Quest Eleven. I'm almost done with Persona 5 Scramble. So I'm playing like these great RPGs. I'm playing these uh, fun like action platformers and stuff, stuff like um, what is it, Volfaris and uh, stuff like that. Really cool games. Um, so when I do have a bit of spare time to um, actually play some games, if I'm not playing the Switch, which is like 90% of the time now, um, I'm just playing some some old you know classic. Like I'll put Castlevania 4 back in and just burn through Castlevania 4 or like Mario World or Donkey Kong Country. So really like. The games that I like to play, it's it's still like a pretty narrow window because I don't have that much time available to play games. So when I do, I just you know kind of play the stuff that I know I'm going to enjoy. So I've been kind of paring this whole collection down a lot recently. I don't know how much I'm going to get rid of, but probably quite a bit. Um, and uh, I'm totally intending to get a, a PS5 come November just because it, it looks awesome. And uh, I have a, a, a friend that works at... Uh, Sony Interactive, and he gets all the stuff like ahead of time. So I'm just, I love listening to him talk about all the stuff they're working on. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to get one of these things. Um, so I'm going to probably be spending a lot more time playing like current gen stuff. Um, so, well, I won't get rid of like all of my games. I still want to have like my Street Fighters and all that stuff around for when I, I want to play them. Um, probably a lot of this stuff is, is going to go at some point. So, yeah, I would say now more of a gamer. And more of a um, uh, YouTuber because, you know, a lot of – for a lot of people, especially when you have like YouTube uh, gaming channels and things like that, a lot of times when you're playing games, you're playing it for the purpose of featuring it on your channel. So like right. when I'm playing retro games and stuff like that, I'm playing them because I'm recording footage because I'm going to put it in some kind of video or something like that. Um, so I'll still have plenty of stuff to play for the channel and uh, just for fun and everything. But yeah, not not so into collecting at this point. Not anywhere near what I was like maybe, I don't know, uh, six, seven years ago. Yeah. Yeah, I went through like a, a rough patch a couple of years ago and I ended up having to sell a, an insane amount of stuff. And the stuff that's irreplaceable is the only stuff that really bugs me. Like I had a couple of monitors that like you can't find at all anymore and like – you know, even if you can find them, they're three thousand dollars for one. It doesn't even work because eBay scalpers ruined it for everybody. So, it, it that was the only stuff I really regretted. But like, I I I have a small collection of stuff that I'm gonna want for the rest of my life. Like I'll play my favorite games every couple of months or a couple of years, depending on the type of game it is. Like a racing game every couple of months, a long form game like Zelda, you know, it's a couple of years. But I that's kind of what I'm down to, and it's not only because the retro RGB is very focused on hardware, but also it's just because it's really hard to recreate the original experience, you know? Like, that's why all those people that are like, oh, just get a Raspberry Pi. Like, of course you can, but that's not what I want. So, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Huh. No factor that in. I don't want to do that. So there's that. Yeah. yeah. That's what it comes down to with all of this stuff, right? It's all just like personal preference. Like, uh, I... I'm I'm the same way. Like uh, I'm not a, a stickler when it comes to like output, like hardware and all that kind of thing. But uh, you know, if I'm gonna sit down to like play my Super Famicom or something, like I want to have my my cartridge and just put it in and play it and everything like that. So like while ROMs, I don't begrudge them or anything like that. I think that's perfectly fine. Um, and I I don't mind playing on them either. It's just yeah, for me personally, I just prefer to have um, you know that that physical media for whatever reason. You could maybe call it just like nostalgia or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, but yeah, I just, I just like to have it. It's just a personal preference thing. It's not really, um, 
not really the most important thing in the world, is it? No. What you play on. It's funny because most retro gamers I know are retro gamers because that's the style of game that they like to play. Maybe they also play modern, maybe they don't. And, you know, nostalgia means nothing once you've gotten past the title screen. Once you're in the game, that's because you're there because you want to play it. But, you know, putting the cartridge in, you know, feeling the tactile pushing of the on switch and all that stuff, like, that absolutely is the nostalgia factor for a lot of people, and it's part of the experience. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. Yeah, I mean, for, what is it, like, uh, there's, like, nostalgia for just, like, the logos and, like, the sounds and stuff, like, uh, a PS1 starting up and everything, you know, like, it's just, um, you know, it's just uh, one of those things. People like it. Like, I liked it when I was 13. I like it now, you know. Agreed. 100%. Don't really see any reason to uh, to stop, you know. Yeah. Or to switch over to something. What is uh, What is your favorite console, then? What are the ones that, you know, you're... I see a lot behind you. What do you have like the most games for and you know, what's your favorite? Oh, the thing I have the most games for is probably my uh, PC engine. I probably have like a few hundred games for that, mm. um, which I'd never even, I'd never played a turbo graphics or anything. I don't know if I'd ever even seen one as a kid. Um, but when I got here though, uh, I got into the PC engine just cause like I, because I had never played it. It was a retro console. I'd never tried out before. And there was like a lot of good stuff on it. You know, I was like, oh, cool. Like, you know, Bomberman, Bonk, and like Dracula X and all this stuff. Um, so I started going, kind of going nuts, uh, collecting for PC Engine, getting everything I could for it. And uh, yeah, I, I still really like the PC Engine. My favorite consoles of all time, though, are definitely the PS1 and the SNES. Hmm. Um, those are just uh, all, like pretty much all my favorite games are on those consoles. And I have a, like a lot of love for a lot of the, like Sega stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, my Saturn, which Saturn is another one that I didn't really even play until I came to Japan. And the Japanese library of Saturn games is just like fantastic. All the, you know, 2D fighters and shoot 'em ups and everything, which is really right up my alley. And uh, Dreamcast, um, I, you know, had a Dreamcast as a kid, uh, luckily, because uh, I was not going to get one. But then the cable company came around and offered us like a few hundred bucks to uh, buy our little satellite dish if we would uh, change over to cable. So I was like, 300 bucks? That's Mom. funny. <laughs> I was like, sell them the satellite. I would like a Dreamcast, please. Uh, so that was how I got my Dreamcast, was the uh, the cable company bought a satellite dish from us, and we had an extra 300 bucks in the bank. And so I begged my parents for a Dreamcast in uh, 2000, I think. And uh, I want, I really, really, what I really, really wanted was a Dreamcast with Shinmu and uh, Jack Ryan Radio. What I got was a Dreamcast with Tokyo Extreme Racer. Still a great game. Uh, so a couple of days later, I had my dad drive me to Funko Land, where I turned in like a mountain of like almost all of my games, like my Super Nintendo, PS1 games, all that stuff. And I had enough money for uh, Shinmu Jet Grind Radio and a Todd McFarlane uh, Tetsuo from Akira action figure. <laughs> so <laughs> that was what I got for all of that stuff I turned in. It's funny to think of all that, all those things. I, I traded in every game I had from childhood to get an, uh, two Xboxes, and I ended up packing them both and uh, putting Media Center on it, XBMC. And that's what I used for you know for ninety nine percent of what I used the Xbox. And then I loaded the emulators up, and I was like, oh, it's the same thing. I don't need those old ones. And just man, not you know at the time it was the right move, but I wish I didn't do that. <laughs> Yeah, I was, um, it was, it wasn't that long, like later when I was, uh, still a teenager, but working and, uh, collecting a paycheck, I spent almost all my money on eBay <laughs> buying, buying, uh, like retro games and stuff like that, but also, uh, buying stuff that I remember, you know, growing up, I used to see things in magazines that I was like, whoa, man, that's awesome. And then, you know, I couldn't get it. like stuff like in retrospect for shitty consoles, like the 3DO and, uh, stuff like that. So when I finally had some money, I was on eBay, like buying a 3DO bundled with 21 games and trying that out and being like, wow, that's pretty shitty. Yes. Uh, so, you know, yes. having friends come over and playing a lot of those games really for a laugh. Mm-hmm. Like we would just play it and be like, what the hell? This is so terrible. So we would have fun playing them because how shitty they were buying a 32 X and Sega CD, all this stuff that was always advertised to be like so cool and everything. Mm-hmm. And then realizing most of those games suck too. But there were some really, you know, hidden gems there. Uh, 
uh, in particular, like Knuckles Chaotix was like a game that I got with my uh, 32X when I you know picked one up when I was like 18 years old or something, and um, just being like, wow, this game is fucking kick ass, and it's like still one of my my favorite uh, 16-bit Sonic games. Um, but yeah, I sold a shit ton of games when I was like. 13 or 14 sold off most of my stuff and then by the time i was like 18 or 19 i was just buying up wasting all of my money on on ebay and then you know 20 20 years old jim comes around he's like well i don't have any money where'd all my money go shit what am i gonna do i'll join the military (laughs) it's like i blew all my money on ebay (laughs) that's pretty funny i uh yeah i got i got into the ebay thing too for a while back when like i remember Right when eBay started, I was finding all the stuff that I wanted as a kid. And I was just like, oh, my God, I can get a Sega Nomad for like 40 bucks or something. And that kind of that kind of all faded. And then when I started Retro RGB, I start, before it was even a website, like it was a Google Doc because my cousin Scott and I wanted to, you know, buy back the consoles we had as a kid. I actually think he still has all his childhood stuff. He never got rid of it. And like... All I really cared about was Master System, Genesis, Nintendo, and Super Nintendo, but really just the 16-bit versions. And then when I decided to like expand, I was like, well, I guess I always wanted a Saturn. So I ended up picking one up, and then I bought like a, a mod chip and a, just a reel of CDRs, and I went and tried to play through all the games I wanted to play as a kid, and so many were terrible, and so many were awesome, too. <laughs> and that's just, you know. Yeah. That was kind of the experience of coming here when... Um you know, it was revealed to me that there were like, I used to do my weekend sort of rounds. Like there were like three or four hard offs all around the, the base. And so on the weekends, I would just get my car and do my, you know, drive to Akishima, drive to Hamura, drive here, drive there, and just go hit all the hard offs and stuff. And that was one of those things where it was like, well, Saturns are like 40 bucks. I just grab a Saturn off the shelf and go grab a, a small library of games for it. Well, this weekend, Hey, here's a, you know, ps1 as like 30 bucks and it comes bundled with uh i think when i bought my ps1 it was bundled with um uh biohazard it had like two controllers and biohazard with it and like memory card i was like and i was like holy shit memory cards and uh and then i, I kept finding memory cards with like stickers on them like kids had put on them like however long ago stickers for like silent hill and like tinchu and stuff and i was like oh man they're like this is so awesome this is like so, like, just every weekend I could go and buy a console and a, a, you know, stack of games for it. So that was what really kind of got me, like, going nuts buying games and stuff, especially when, like, I picked up my Saturn and my PC Engine. There was, like, so much stuff that I hadn't played yet. So I was just, like, getting it all and, like, trying it all out. And then, uh, especially for consoles like the PlayStation and uh, the SNES, where, like, the library is, like, double the size in Japan. Like, the, for every game you've played, there's one in Japan you haven't. And just finding stuff that I had never known existed, like um, as a as a teen, not so much now, but I was then like a big fan of anime, mm-hmm. and my favorite was usually the more adult themed, like sci fi, cyberpunk anime kind of stuff. And as a kid, I was a big fan of Battle Angel Alita, mm-hmm. like that was like one of my favorites, uh, two part anime OVA and the manga and all that. Like I, that stuff was great. And then just one day in a hard off, just by happenstance, I came across the the Battle Angel game. And I was like, holy shit, there's like a Battle Angel game. Mm-hmm. And I was like, just something I had never. So that that weekend, I'm just sitting there like playing Battle Angel all weekend because it's like a, a beat em up action RPG kind of thing that is like, like word for word, like, you know, the manga, like it's so faithful to the manga. So just like discovering stuff like that was like what really got me really into and like excited about like like collecting games here and and game hunting and stuff because like to this day like I've been doing it for like almost a decade and I still come across stuff all the time where I'm like I have no idea what the hell this is so it's uh that's exciting it's it's more fun to find stuff that is kind of like um you know it, it's fun to go and like hunt for things and find stuff that you like you're familiar with and like oh I know this I want to get this but it's I think it's maybe more so when you find stuff that you have no idea what the hell it is. And so, like, there's that sort of gamble. Like, this might be something cool. Let me, you know, pick it up. It's only a couple of bucks. And then it turns into, like, one of your new favorite games or something. So. Yeah. That's pretty awesome, man. Yeah, that is pretty neat. I've I've discovered a lot. Um, but it's it's mostly – the stuff I've discovered is mostly from friends that, that kind of know the style of game that I like. And I get their recommendation and go. So I never – I mean, I guess the only time in my life I'd ever really done the whole like 
let's go to a store and look for something and try to find something cool. It was with music, I guess. Um, but it was still, uh-huh. I, I, maybe I, maybe I'm a cheapskate or maybe I have trust issues or something. I don't know. But like, I, as much as I would love to go into a store and be like, oh, this looks neat. Like, well, I like browsing and looking around. Like, it's always been for me, like friends' recommendations. Like, oh, this is a good game, but you, you don't like Final Fantasy, so you're don't don't play this game. Play this game instead, and then I'll go find it. Like, someone told me about. Oh, I have it saved here. Somebody told me about a Super Nintendo game that I would really like. Um, Gunman's Hero? Is that what it's called? Like the Japanese game that's kind of like Zelda, but not Zelda? Okay. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that one, actually. Gotta wait for my hard drive to spin up here. I got one of those. Uh, I have everything on power save mode for when I'm not using it. Uh, hold on. It should be right here. No. No. I didn't leave it here. Like an idiot. But yeah, there, there's one game that's uh that's apparently kind of like a link to the past, but it's not. And you know, I just that seems like something that's really neat that I would like. There are so many really great uh, Japanese games for the Super Famicom. Like years ago, I did a, a top ten list for the ones that were my favorite that I'd actually played because there's a bunch that I still haven't. Um, but games, uh, I mean, at, like I, for my number one, I put, uh, Seiken Densetsu 3, which I think now is called Trials of Mana or something. So that's been re-released mm-hmm. since then. But at the time I was like, wow, this game is amazing. Like it was like, it was just fantastic. Other stuff like, the uh, the violinist of Hamel, which is a great game. It's like a, a side scrolling platformer where you have the violinist and his, um, his sort of like, uh, she's almost like a servant girl or like slave girl named Flute. And you essentially like use her for all the platforming. Like if you got to get up high, you like jump on her head and then go somewhere. And you put her in all these different animal suits that have these different properties. So you can make her like walk along spikes or like fly through the air. So it's almost like the the entire crux of the game is like you, you abusing her to like get across all these these platforming areas and stuff like that. And it's all played like really comically. Um, but like that game is amazing. Uh, Gundam wing, uh, what is it? Uh, endless duel, which is a, a Gundam, like 2d fighter, uh, made by Natsume. So if you ever played one of their, like the, the power Rangers fighting game they did, um, it's kind of similar to that, uh, super back to the future Two, which is fun. You're Marty McFly on the hoverboard. Like it's a platformer. Um, that's, that's really that's fun. So game. like all kinds of games like that. Yeah, it's very, it's very, it's very cool. It's uh, and almost like all, all of the bosses are like the different iterations of Biff. So like That's you'll have funny. like future Biff, and he's got his his baseball bats, and he's you know you're bouncing off of his head and stuff. Or there's like future like Trump Biff. He's like trying to shoot you, and you have to like electrocute him or something like that. Um, so it's great, and the the soundtrack on it is amazing because a lot of the tracks are uh, like um, these 16 bit remixes of the Back to the Future theme. And everything is super deformed, so they're like kind of chibi and cute with big heads and stuff. Um, so that game's amazing. That's And that's another one that's like, it's weird that like Back to the Future is like a really popular, you know, series. You would think that that would be something they would want to release internationally, but nope, uh, only in Japan that that they're uh, Back to the Future game. Um, but there's a lot of good no, stuff the, like that. Back to the Future too. is that the style of game where like there's no saves, you just you get good at it, play it over and over and beat it, or does it have like a save system where you could treat it like um, more of an adventure style as well? There's no saves. I think there's passwords in it though. So, close um, enough, but it's yeah. just yeah, but it's a straight uh, platformer. You're Marty. You're on the hoverboard, so you can like zip around and you know jump off things. And when you jump, he does a flip, and so the flip is your attack. So you have to like bounce off enemies while you're flipping, but you can like, you go through and you collect coins and they're like little vending machine things that you can spin your coins on for like extra life or like, a, a and t- take an extra hit or something like that. Um, and it's, yeah, pretty much just straight up action platformer, but with, you know, back to the future characters and settings and everything like that. So it's, uh, it's pretty cool. I'm intrigued. That's going to be added to my list of things that hopefully I'll find some yeah. time for someday. <laughs> Yeah, definitely, definitely check that out. I think um, it was uh, there's an AVGN episode actually, where he's revisiting the NES Back to the Future games and just talking about how how much they suck. And then at the end of the episode, he's like, "Oh well, here's a Back to the Future game from Japan." He was like, "This one must be so shitty. They didn't even want to release it internationally." And then he starts playing it, and he was he's like, 
yeah, it's fucking good. <laughs> it's like a really good That's game. That's right. That's where I've heard it before. That you know, actually AVGN's what got me back into all this stuff. Justin, aka the Goodwill Hunter, we worked together for a while and I'm in the back room one time trying to design some crap that we were working on and I just hear like you know, that's a shitload of fuck. I'm like, what is that? <laughs> I was like, turn that up, whatever that is. <laughs> like that, that was it. I was hooked from there. I, I bought a, a, a bunch of virtual console games like a week later, and then I wanted to get a controller adapter so you could play the original controllers. And I was like, ah, something's still not right. I didn't realize at the time it was lag, but you know, I was like, something's still not right. So it doesn't feel right. And that's you know, next thing you know, I blinked an eye, and retro RGB is is a thing. <laughs> Well, that's been the beauty of YouTube is just, you know, it's, it's made it possible to like discover all this stuff or rediscover it. Um, when I was uh, about to move to Japan, I was living in Germany at the time. And like, you know, the furthest thing from my mind was like retro gaming. Like I had my, my Xbox 360, but mostly what I was doing in Germany was like hanging out with my girlfriend and drinking beer and like playing guitar. Like that was really all I was doing the whole time I was in Germany. And, uh, so when I, you know, I got an assignment to Japan um, that because it had been the longest time, like I had no interest in the things I was interested in when I was a kid. Like as a kid, I really liked anime. Uh, I liked manga and I was, you know, playing you know, like a ton of video games and everything. And when I was like, uh, 23 was when I found out I was coming to Japan. And so like, I wasn't so into those things anymore. Um, so that sort of like rekindled my, my interest in that. They're like, Oh, you're going to Japan. I was like, Oh, okay. Well, I guess I better get back into this stuff, though, if I'm going to, you know, be at the, you know, at the source. Um, so I was looking at a lot of YouTube and I was mostly looking at um, I was looking at like travel vlog type stuff and uh, just trying to get a feel for where I was going to be and everything. And I was, um, you know, I watched gaming videos and things like that. Like I would watch AVGN at the time and stuff. So when I was looking at Japanese things, some of the stuff that would be recommended to me was like, um, uh, I, I found Luke Morse one at the time, which he was someone who had been on YouTube for a long time and he was doing hard off, uh, game hunting videos and things. And I started finding videos of people in Akihabara going to uh, game stores like super potato and stuff like that. So like when I was seeing that stuff, like that was rekindling my interest in like retro gaming because it seemed like it was so abundant mm -hmm. and so readily available. So um, by that time, so like four months preparing for my, my move to Japan and the entire time, like watching these YouTube videos and things like that. By the time I finally got here, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I was like that first weekend, I was like, let's go to, let's go to super potato, you know, and I had never been to Akiba before in my life, but I knew where the, you know, the specific shops I wanted to go to were because I had seen some YouTube videos and stuff. So that was like, if I hadn't seen all of that stuff, I probably, when I got here, wouldn't have had, uh, you know, that, that interest to, you know, re-pick up like retro gaming and stuff, uh, that I did. Um, like, cause I was doing other things when I got here, I was still playing guitar. I was still doing a lot of drinking hanging out with chicks and stuff like that. That would have probably just been like just all my time. I would have been like video games. What the fuck that? Who cares? Um, but no. So I was able to have video games on top of all that stuff. Uh, and a lot of that is thanks to just like watching people on YouTube and being like, Hey, that's pretty cool. I want to do that. So that's a thing that I would say to people if they're going to come and visit Japan, brush up on your Japanese. It's really, really helpful. <laughs> yeah. But how does one do that? Cause I started to learn Mandarin Chinese when I was in Taiwan for a while. And it, it, it just, for yeah. me, it was cause I grew up with a bunch of family members that, that that's either like extended family members that, spoke broken English or two languages. So I would hear people talking around me all the time. So I got yeah. to learn mannerisms and like, you could kind of get the gist of what people are saying and stuff like that. But like when you're actually trying to sit down and learn a language, like, you know, hello, thank you. I'm sorry. Bathroom, you know, shot a Jägermeister and a Guinness. Like I, you know, I, I learned all that stuff, but can you really, do you think someone could really do that going, going into a completely different language and just, you say brush up on your Japanese, like, yeah, I mean, you have to do it. Like I would say, just give yourself plenty of time because you're going to, you know, do it like incrementally. Hmm. Right. So, um, when I first got here, all the Japanese I learned was either what I learned in my spare time or what I learned from just like talking with friends, which it was funny because they, um, a comment about, uh, military guys was that when they spoke Japanese, they, they quote unquote, uh, spoke like a woman, or, or sounded like a woman or something like that. 
um, because there are like differences between, I guess, how you would phrase things, right. uh, masculine and feminine. And most of the military dudes were learning all their Japanese from their Japanese girlfriends. So like that was That's how they funny. were learning to speak. Um, but when I started in university and I was uh, minoring in Japanese, um, we just had a series of um, uh, books called Genki, which were like really good at like um, starting you at the very basics and vocabulary and basic phrasing and uh, grammar and stuff. And just like slowly but surely building your listening, speaking, reading and writing abilities. So if you approach it from like that perspective that it's going to take time and you do things like incrementally and just um, because a lot of it is like get your vocabulary appropriate, learn the appropriate grammar. And then just once you have like that, that sort of like core, you can mostly be um, comfortable like conversationally, right? Or at least comfortable enough to like get around and like talk to people if you need things. Um, So don't, uh, don't take on too much at once. So like get a book like that, get the first chapter and really try to absorb everything that's in that first chapter before you move on to the second one. So don't feel like a need to like rush and be like, okay, I got it. Next thing, like actually have it and to like where you can be comfortable, like recalling it if you need to before you move on to the next thing. So just like take it slow because too many people are like, well, I need to like speak this like now. And no, you don't. You don't need to speak that now. Really, if you want to, you know, learn it, it's that's why they call it a learning process, Mm. right? It's not, an ev- it's not an event. It doesn't just happen. So you have to be um, comfortable with the fact that it's going to take time. You know, give yourself six months and um, start start at the beginning and see where you are in six months. You know, seems about fair. Some people yeah. tend to pick up languages better than others, though. I am not one of those people. But uh, yeah, me neither. <laughs> I, I, well, I mean, you're living there. You're speaking it, so you're winning. <laughs> yeah, I. I I I do my best, but like, yeah, it, it's it's been a long hard road because <laughs> I'm not I'm not always the best uh, student, I guess, when it comes to things like that. Hmm. Well, this was absolutely freaking awesome. This was a whole lot of fun. I, uh, I I'd probably keep going if it wasn't almost midnight for me, and you know I'm starting to fade. But this was a this was a blast. Definitely going to do something like this again. Maybe we'll just do it live and just hang out, and uh, we'll drag Jimmy Hoppa with us so we could just do like a. Just do like a live yeah. stream with beers or something like that. Oh, yeah. Bring a lot of beers for Jimmy. That guy likes to drink. Yeah, I've drank with him in person a couple of times. He is so much fun. He's the same as he is on his streams. He's a, an awesome human being. Yep. Yeah, it's just, yeah. Yep, he comes uh, He comes to Tokyo occasionally, and we'll we'll hang out and drink beers and stuff like that. And uh, it's always always a good time hanging out with Jimmy. I'll end. I'll end on one of my favorite Jimmy Hoppe stories. We're in Vegas. We were day drinking all day long, and at the end of the night, I was like, "All right, I gotta, you know, get on the plane and fly home." And he was like, "Yeah, I'll go back to, you know, where I'm staying." I was like, "Well, let's just grab dinner, though. You know, we gotta have something to sober us up a little bit." And he's like, "I hear there's a, a really good White Castle down the street." I'm like, "I don't fuck a White Castle." So we're we're <laughs> walking around the block, and you know. I was like, what about this? What about this? What about this? And we're walking and I didn't realize it, but he walked me around the entire block and walked me directly into the White Castle. <laughs> that was all he was not having it. He didn't want anything else. He wanted his White Castle. And that was that. And when I tell you we were by far the best looking people in that White Castle, it is not a compliment to Jimmy and I. I'm just saying that definitely wasn't where I wanted to eat. <laughs> hey, Jimmy's a, Jimmy's a handsome enough guy. Um, absolutely but he uh first time i met jimmy he came came to stay in tokyo he came stayed uh with me at my apartment for a couple of days and we did some like game hunting and stuff and but the entire time we didn't play a single fucking video game <laughs> we just drank the entire time <laughs> never touched a game just drank the whole time so fun stuff absolutely well thanks very much for doing this jim uh just to end it where are the best where is the best place for people to find you twitter youtube instagram like what's the the number one or two places uh youtube is my my main focus youtube.com forward slash kids sure you can but you can also find me on uh instagram um i post a lot of photos there when i go out game hunting or just when i go out and do you know normal fun things so that's always good uh, you can also find me on Twitter and Facebook. It's all kids sure you can. It's all the exact same thing. Uh, but I'm all over the place, so come uh, check out what I got and uh, say hi, and you will be welcomed with open arms. Awesome. Thanks very much, man. We'll do this again soon. Thank you for having me. <laughs>